This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for February 24th, 2021. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm talking with Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Eric and Lindsay, here in the United States, the vaccine rollout is well underway. There have been many hiccups, but more than 40 million first doses have been administered in the United States and more than 17 million in the United Kingdom. But the vaccine coverage winner thus far appears to be Israel where 45% of the population has already been vaccinated. Israel makes a good laboratory for vaccination. It's a small country that was able to secure a large number of doses very early. This means that Israel is among the first places where we can get some idea of the large-scale, real-world effectiveness of vaccination. Today, we published one of the first large studies. What did we learn? Steve, as you pointed out, Israel has taken a very aggressive approach not only making vaccines available, but offering incentives for those willing to take them. And that's driven a very rapid response. The report that we published came from a large HMO, the largest of the four HMOs that cover the entire country, that by itself ensures more than half the population. The investigators used a database that contains a wealth of information about the health status of participants, their demographics, and their COVID-19 status. This allowed them to perform an observational study that describes the outcomes of vaccine recipients and compare them on a daily basis to match controls who had not yet received the vaccine. They then looked for the severity of disease and categorized outcomes ranging from asymptomatic to dead. And all this was done with BNT162B2, the Pfizer vaccine, which is the only one available in Israel. This was a very large group. It included almost 600,000 vaccine recipients matched one-to-one based on demographics and risk factors with a similar number of controls. The follow-up time was short, a median of only 15 days. But at the height of the epidemic, this still meant that there were more than 10,000 documented infections, more than half of which were symptomatic. It's important to recognize that, as this was a very short study, the majority of people only received a single dose of vaccine. Thus, the results really address the very early effectiveness of the vaccine. So with that caveat, how did it work? Well, fortunately, it works quite well. Again, most individuals only received a single dose. Nevertheless, starting two weeks after the first dose of the vaccine, it was almost 50% effective against both infection and disease. And starting seven days after the second dose, the vaccine was more than 90% effective. Subgroup analysis produced almost identical results. People were protected against asymptomatic, symptomatic, and severe disease, and they were protected about equally well no matter what their pre-existing risks were. These results are very similar to the original, much smaller phase three trial. It's an observational study. It's not tightly controlled like the phase three trials were, but these results do suggest that vaccination really does protect in real life. I mean, Eric, as you point out, it is quite gratifying to see that the real world observational data mirror consonant with the randomized RCT data from the phase three trials that have been reported. However, it is challenging in observational data to truly understand the differences between the groups who did or didn't receive vaccination because it's not random. So therefore, there may be some systematic issues that impact the strength of the conclusions. On the other hand, It is very impressive to see such decrements in cases, both symptomatic and asymptomatic, and reassures many of us that the vaccines are behaving in ways that we hope they would. I agree that observational studies are obviously much more difficult to understand. And in a very large population like this, we have no idea why some people got vaccinated early as opposed to the people who weren't yet vaccinated. And does that represent different risk groups? On the other hand, even observational studies like this are pretty good at detecting 90% differences. And so although the absolute magnitude may be not quite what was reported for this, it's going to be awfully good. And the fact that that 90% number matches pretty well what was seen in the randomized control trials suggests that it probably is pretty close to right. And as the rollout continues to speed up across Israel and elsewhere, we'll have many more opportunities to see data suggesting the same efficacy.
and hopefully will allow some dramatic control of spread. I think that's right, Lindsay. And of course, one of the big advantages that they have in Israel is that these HMOs are coordinated healthcare delivery systems, and therefore they have both vaccination data and outcome data all linked together. And there are other places like that. The UK and the National Health Service also has the opportunity to do these kinds of observational studies and do them well. It is more difficult, obviously, to do that in the US where healthcare is much more fragmented. Still, we're going to be seeing data from large HMOs and large healthcare systems that I think are going to be similar in quality to this that will give us further answers. I mean, along those lines, Eric, this does highlight the point that for infectious diseases in particular, coordinated community responses with effective control measures can benefit everyone in that community. As transmission goes down for highly communicable respiratory illness, then everyone is benefiting. And that's something that with respiratory viruses and infectious diseases, we have to remember is that these are a little bit different than, you know, my lipids and my blood pressure, which are important, but have a direct effect on my health and less of an implication on others. And I think there's a lot to be learned from organized public health rollout of what I would argue are common sense interventions. Yeah, I totally agree. And I'd extend that beyond infectious disease. Coordinated medical care certainly helps in research, but it probably also provides a consistent level of care to people. And that is possible in some places like Israel and the UK and more difficult here. One of the big concerns we discussed last week is that vaccination might not provide as robust protection against the new variant strains of the virus. Did we learn anything from this Israeli study that helps us address that question? I'd say no, not yet. At the time this study was performed, the most important variants around the world were not yet widely circulating in Israel, at least as far as we know. There was no viral sequencing. So we don't know if the specific individuals who got infected despite having received vaccines were preferentially infected with one or another viral strain. I suspect we'll learn more soon, uh, though the information may not come from Israel. It may come from elsewhere where these strains are much more prevalent. I think that the infectious pressure to create variants is in part related to the community burden of virus. So when there is a lot of replication going on in the community, a greater chance for variants to emerge and to escape whatever immune pressure is emerging in that community, be it natural or associated with iatrogenic or vaccine elicited responses. So I think that, or I hope that by decreasing the viral burden in Israel, a country, the likelihood of variants occurring and escaping should decrease. However, if those variants are already present in high number, then they will declare themselves and escape around the immune pressure from vaccine. And Eric, as you pointed out, the variants are likely more heavily prevalent elsewhere in the world. So the effect of failure of vaccine, if that is to occur, is probably more likely to be seen elsewhere. But without sequencing, it's hard to know the nature of the escape of the viruses circulating in Israel. And that will be interesting to know. But again, this phenomenon may be better elucidated elsewhere in the world. One way to think about the variants is by analogy with drug-resistant bacterial infections. Drug-resistant bacterial infections arise in two ways. Because this is infectious disease, certainly there's always selection going on so that in an individual, there can be mutations that arise that give rise to a new antibiotic resistant strain through whatever mechanism, whether it's by mutation or acquisition of new DNA or, or whatever. But most antibiotic resistance is not newly generated, it's transmitted. So as you're saying, Lindsay, there are two kinds of things going on here. There is selection around a population that already exists. When a strain is introduced into a country, for example, if we have the UK strain, we have the Brazilian strain, we have the South African strain here in the US, uh, we know that. But there also can be the generation of new resistant strains, new strains that can 
get around pre-existing immunity to some extent, and they'll continue to arise. So what we can say about Israel right now is that the strains we know about, the ones that are raising concern that would have likely come from outside, aren't circulating. That doesn't mean that new strains aren't going to arise. I mean, I guess, Eric, I would sort of add another dimension to SARS-CoV-2. Given that it has newly jumped species a year ago, the virus itself is figuring out how to better co-adapt to the human host, or at least that's my speculation, so that there is a tremendous amount of viral adaptation going on separate from vaccine or other induced immune responses to just better adapt to a new host. That may change the immunodominant epitopes, may change the targets for the immune response. And so that that is another feature that I think is driving a lot of evolution in the virus that down the road, maybe we'll understand as we better elucidate the biology and the interaction with the host and the host receptors and the pathogenesis. In addition, there is drug resistant analog and immunologic selective pressure that is more targeted. But I think we have a novel event where there are trillions of virions that have been generated in the last year globally all trying to figure out how to be better host adapted. And some of them are succeeding and then dominating in the SARS-CoV-2 space as it spreads. As the number of cases has risen throughout the world, the number of people who've recovered from infection and therefore have at least some protection against reinfection has also risen. So what does that mean for how we interpret vaccine data? In this study, pre-existing immunity would affect both groups. There's evidence that people who had been previously infected have a much more pronounced antibody response to a single dose of the vaccine. This would lead some people in the vaccine group having better than expected protection at early time points. On the other hand, people in the control group who were previously infected also have some degree of protection. So altogether, it's difficult to know how this would have affected the results of this study. But it's important to realize that all vaccination efforts going on now are happening in the background of a significant number of immune individuals. So that really could change the dynamics of the outbreak. And it's important to point out that these studies were done at a much later time point than the phase three studies when there was much less immunity around in the population. In Israel, everyone is getting BNT162B2, the Pfizer vaccine. Can we extrapolate at all from what we're learning there to what's going to happen in places that are using other vaccines? To some extent, it's very likely, for example, that what we learn about the Pfizer vaccine will be true for mRNA 1273, the Moderna vaccine. This is another mRNA based vaccine. It performed almost identically in the phase three trials. And so there's every reason to believe that the results will be similar. And remember that as of today, although perhaps not in a few days, um, that covers all of the currently available vaccines in the US. Most of the other vaccines that are in widespread use are based on an adenoviral delivery system, including both the Russian Sputnik vaccine and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And although it hasn't been given an emergency use authorization yet, the Janssen vaccine, which we reviewed by the FDA advisory panel on Friday, while these vaccines differ in their biology from the mRNA vaccines, the phase three studies were performed in a broadly similar way. And that suggests to me that in the absence of a big role for variants, the real life performance of these vaccines is likely to mirror that seen in the trials. I mean, I think that how we best understand the immunity elicited, you know, may be impacted by the insert, the delivery system, and then ultimately, we do have to figure out a correlate of protection. And that's likely going to be required for each of the vaccine constructs. And without that, it's going to be tricky to compare vaccine A to vaccine B, although we are going to want to do that as we make decisions about rollout and access. But this is going to be a very challenging issue for special populations, for changes in the vaccine constructs because of emerging and dominating variants 
that will lead to lots of discussion over the months ahead of us as we figure out how to determine what to move forward. It will be definitely a complicated environment to compare these countermeasures and how to use them. There's already an issue in the UK that's been reported in the popular press of people trying to vaccine shop, trying to figure out which vaccine they want to get. I'd argue that right now, we don't know enough about the performance of these vaccines to make an educated guess as to what's right for any individual or for any population. And certainly at this point, as a consumer or as a practitioner, I'd recommend that people get whatever vaccine they can get. But I think you're right, Lindsay, we will face the issue of the differences among these vaccines and what that tells us about how best to use them. We've talked about the increasing levels of immunity generated by vaccination and by infection. Is that immunity contributing to the falling infection rate that we seem to be seeing in most parts of the world today? I mean, Steve, that's such a complicated question. Why is transmission decreasing, or at least clinically diagnosed infection decreasing in many parts of the world? And there are many factors that may be impacting that in different environments. Hopefully, prior wild type infection with immunity does protect against future infection, although with other coronaviruses or seasonal coronaviruses, that protection is meza meza. You know, it's not as complete as we would like. And that may or may not end up being the case with SARS-CoV-2. There are some data that that may not be the case from South Africa and other parts of the world where emerging variants may escape the wild type immunity elicited by earlier strains. But we need to understand that better. As Eric already mentioned, vaccination and as we've seen in Israel, can be very effective at decreasing illness and may substantially boost immune responses in those previously infected with wild-type virus. Whether vaccine-elicited immunity or natural infection immunity are comparable, we don't know. We do know in vitro that titers or certain aspects of the immune response may be higher with vaccine-elicited immunity and even higher when you've been previously infected and then vaccinated. But sadly, it's very difficult to translate that into clinical efficacy and strong evidence-based public policy. But the combination of wild-type infection, vaccination, mask wearing, appropriate testing, isolation, quarantine, and other public health measures And perhaps seasonality with warming up and summer in some places, therefore enabling broader distances between individuals, may all come together to help in diminishing transmission. But it's hard to know which of these factors is most important, which is why I think we need to use all of them to our collective public health advantage. Yeah, I agree completely with that, Lindsay. There just probably isn't enough immunity around to account for the rapidity of the drop, whether that's immunity induced by vaccines or immunity induced by previous infection. And while it may be contributing to the drop, as you said, all these other measures and these differences in the environment may play a role. I will say that it's both gratifying and a little surprising to see the drop being so dramatic, but it suggests that a lot of the social measures that you mentioned, Lindsay, are actually being effective and are actually being implemented fairly well in a lot of places in the world. I mean, don't get me wrong. I am optimistic that vaccine and vaccine delivery is playing a big role in the substantial drop in transmission and new infections. But I think we have to be very careful before we draw firm conclusions. And given the explosive transmission we've seen with this virus in the last year and increased transmissibility with certain emerging variants recently, like the 117 from the UK, we need to be careful not to let our guard down and we need to stay vigilant with all of our control measures until we understand how different control measures like vaccines really behave and how we can use them properly. Because until we stop transmission and allow our hospitals to get some breathing room and our communities to open, we're going to continue to have the tremendous problems we've been having for the last year. 
I'd make one additional point. The highest risk groups that are largely receiving vaccine in the U.S. are not the highest transmitting groups. They're the people at most risk of getting severe disease for the most part. Healthcare workers are an exception and they were early. But as we immunize older individuals and people with comorbidities, who are the bulk of people now receiving the vaccine, they're not the people in the community who are most likely to transmit. And so as we spread to a different group of individuals, like the essential workers, et cetera, those people are likely to have a bigger impact on transmission, assuming that the vaccines really do decrease transmission. If that's true, and it's likely to be true, then we're going to see a dramatically increased effect once we can get vaccine into a large number of those arms. Just to amplify that, we need to remember this is a global problem. So we'll see in smaller experimental models like Israel, the US, the UK, places where vaccines being rolled out, hopefully some of these principles can be established, as you suggest. But in order for us to really control this problem, we have to remember it's a global issue and it's highly transmissible. And as we learn these lessons, they have to be applied everywhere. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Eric.